Hey, what's up, everybody? Today on Trust and Believe, I have the amazing <laughs> other half, Scotty B, aka Scott Blocker. I'm so happy you are able to join us today. We're going to be talking about everything from kids to travel to what makes Scott an expert at reading people. There's a reason why he's always quiet around the house, and we're going to get into that now. Hopefully you can, after this conversation, talk to your spouse if you have one and find a little more information about them to bring you closer together. Get ready to trust and believe. Somebody say it again. No, no, no. What's up? Better than Oprah. Come on, y'all. This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. Hey, what's up, everybody? I have some questions for you. Oh, no, I'm scared. I'm actually nervous. I don't know why. We've been together for so many years, but I'm actually nervous. I don't know what you're going to ask me. You should be nervous. No, the reason why I'm excited to interview you today, because most of the time when we get on camera, we're talking and bantering. Yes. And today is not going to be talking and bantering. Today is going to be about you. I have a couple things I want to talk to you about today. Okay. But I will start by saying that a couple days ago, I asked you, I said, what do you think you're an expert at? Oh, yeah. And you, were, you said you're an expert at reading people. And I just thought that was very interesting because you don't have a doctorate in reading. <laughs> but maybe because you're almost 50 years old, you have enough. You have an honorary doctorate in reading people. But I actually thought a little bit more about you saying that specifically. And I was saying to myself, that's really interesting because around the house and at work, you are very quiet. And I was saying... He probably really is good at reading people because you're always listening and being nosy on the low. Oh. So, anyway, I'm he's my husband, so I can play around. <laughs> so, what makes you an expert at, read, at reading people? Uh, I don't know that I... W- well, what makes me an expert? I feel that because of all the experience that I've had and because of the fact that I am 465 years old, that... Uh, I have years upon years upon years of of obs- observing observations. Uh, I, I think because of how I grew up, and because I didn't feel like I could talk to anyone about being gay, I was always observing everyone else. Uh, and taking in information from them. It was back then, it was more about why, what makes this person not be teased of being gay? Like, if they're uh, a guy or a boy uh, in elementary school, or whatever, why are they not teasing him and why are they teasing me? And so I would watch them and observe them. And then as I got older, I would always process things in my head. And then after six years of therapy, of speaking with someone about stuff in life, I realized that I discovered things about myself that now I see other people are doing and I think, oh, okay, I did that or I understand why they're doing that or so I'm definitely not an expert, but I just feel like I sense things uh, because of all the years of experience that I've had. What are some of the things you see people doing that not necessarily make you cringe, but you say to yourself, this person is going through that and I remember doing that same thing. Um, uh, I think when I see someone start sweating the small stuff, I can tell, I'll observe, you know, they'll start asking me questions in a really kind of speedy fashion. And I think to myself, okay, what's really going on? Like this, we're not really talking about this. We're actually talking about, we're not, we're not actually talking about it yet, but we're going to get to what the stress is that's forcing the speed of the words or the, the actions that someone is, is going through out. And once we get, uh, if once we take off the layers of the, uh, peel the the onion back, if you will. You'll get to the meat of the problem. And I, I don't. I have a specific example, but I don't want anyone to think that I'm using them as a as a reason, or, or just I, I observe something um, this morning with a client, 
uh, with the text exchange that I was like, oh, okay. They're feeling stress from the client, and so that stress is being projected on me. Uh, instead of saying, hey, you know what? The client was a little annoying this morning. They're asking for these things. They were saying, okay, where's this, where's this, and where's this? And I was like, whoa, slow down. Like, what's really going on here? And that, come to find out that it was the client that was pressing them for information that, that they needed to get from me. And I was like, okay, let me give the information. And let me solve this, help you solve this. So, so, people, so people react a certain way without divulging the real stressor that's happening. Yes. You see people doing that a lot. What about social media? Because sometimes we'll be watching social media and I'll see you either like, you're like, oh my God, like you see somebody acting a certain way and you're like, I remember being like that or you don't think it's authentic. It's funny you asked that question because I was thinking about that this morning that, you know, I see people on social who say, you know, for all those people that are hating on me, you know, I don't care because I'm going to do me. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, that's really great. But are you putting up... The essence of social media is instant gratification, right? You put something up and you get instant feedback. I think that people uh, start relying on that instant feedback and they put so much weight into that feedback that it impacts themselves. When the essence of social media, Instagram, is showing a picture that you really like and it doesn't matter what other people are saying or it doesn't matter how many likes you get or whatever. It's about you expressing yourself. So I feel that that as much as people say things like, you know, I don't I don't care about what other people think about me. Okay, well then why are you like what's the main reason why you're on social? Because if it's you're posting something and you're instantly looking at the likes and you're instantly looking at, you know, the comments and the feedback, then you aren't just on social for posting a pretty picture. You're on social for the feedback to to fill some void in yourself. Of which, okay, let's talk about that void. Like, what are you not getting out of your everyday life or your brain or your surroundings that um, that you need to get from social media? I never understood, maybe because I didn't grow up with social media and I kind of look at it as just a, a entertainment factor. <laughs> but when I, I, uh, I know that if I'm posting something, that there could be a potential of someone post, you know, making a comment that you suck or you're gay or you're hateful, whatever. And I think to myself, okay, well, if I'm going to put myself out there, I have to expect that as a potential response. And if I get it, I can't be upset at it because I'm putting myself out there. So there are people who put it out there and then get affected by the responses. And it's like, well, you put yourself out there. I'm not saying that it's okay that they're doing it, but there's going to be that possibility and you have to be prepared for it. So Yeah, I've actually... I mean, you definitely, not you, I definitely put on social media because you connect with your fans or you connect with your followers or, um, so yeah, you do want to know who's engaged and, you know, that's kind of like, I mean, social media is basically hanging out with friends that aren't really in the room. Right. But, um, I definitely have grown, let, you know, I just did a podcast on like how I look and I talked about how, um, over the years, like subconsciously, I worry about what people think I look like as a fitness instructor, but I think I look fucking fine. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> Literally. For the record, so do I. But definitely when it comes to... I've grown to care less about what people think about me as like a... Like, whether I'm gay or my family or whatever. But I definitely think... I mean, we wouldn't be on social media. People have social media uh, because they are running a business or... Yeah whatever the case may be. So they definitely want the instant gratification. I do think that is so interesting because when I look at Chip's phone, like in his Instagram, he doesn't get the amount of likes. He gets like hundreds of likes, thousands of likes, tens of thousands of likes or whatever. Like it's not a specific number where I get the exact number of likes or views on a post or whatever. And I just think that that's really interesting how some people are... how Instagram in some way has taken away the exact amount of likes as opposed to there are some people that liked it. But the reason why I say that is because I almost wish they changed mine to that because I just think it's it's such a great way for you to post about your life or to post about the things that you want and not necessarily worry about 
how many people liked it. I I focus more on the engagement. I love the engagement. Mm -hmm. I love the people that are commenting and having fun. But I also know that there are times where you know that people are being fake and struggling and that annoys you too. Yes. So to go back to um, the reason, well, two things I want to say before I get into that. One, the reason why they're not going to change yours is because there are businesses that are putting money into your posts and they need the proof that their post is doing what they want, right? So unfortunately, because you do have a business and a platform that that probably won't change. And then I also, what you said earlier, which I thought was really fascinating, you're like, Instagram or social media is is you hanging out with friends who aren't in the room, right? But it's more than that. I mean, there you have one over one million followers. You don't have one million friends, right? You have a group of people that that um, are friends be- uh, that we have on social that you've met on social. But it's 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 this room filled with your friends. With people sitting in the rafters in chairs going like this. But what know? if I love to put on a show? No, you love to put on a show. And I'm not saying... <laughs> I'm no, not, no, no, I'm no. I'm being silly. I know. I, and and I think a lot of people do. But I, I realize that it isn't as simple as that purely by your statement because there are people who are like, okay, well, I'm going to observe from afar and I'm going to throw daggers or I'm going to, you know, but or I throw think love. I'm saying, I was saying that's how I look at yes. it. Yes. Like for me, I know my community... I know our our true family and our true friends. And if people come in and follow the page, I'm like, oh, maybe they got something from this post. And then if they unfollow the page and they're not, I'm saying that I post as if these people are friends that I've even oh, never met before. That's it. how I am able to not stress about it as much, you yeah. know? Because yeah. there'll be some great stuff that we post about that's like really fun and people still don't like it, yeah. you know? So... So going back to what you were saying, though, is when I see people on social that I cringe or whatever, I just think it's not the thing, it's the thing. Like, what? let's, you know, I already said it earlier, but it's like, I wish I could reach through my phone and be able to sit and have a conversation with this person so that they, because I, I, I relate to them. I, I know how much pain I was in, um, P.S., pre-Sean. Because I wanted people to like me for who I was and they didn't, or at least I didn't think that they did. And so I was doing so much to make everyone like me. I was the nicest guy. People, oh, your Scott's always so nice. He's so nice. And I'm like, I was being extra nice because I didn't want them to see who I really was because I was fearful that they would. Wait, um, so you're not really that nice. <laughs> I'm authentically nice. <laughs> <laughs> I want the best for people because I know how I felt when I was younger. Because I was like, I hated it. I don't want anyone to feel that way. So, you know, I'm here to help. I wanted to start there in the conversation because you do still, at 49 years old, um, the fact that you were being teased as gay, you still talk about it. And I find it to be so interesting because for many reasons. One... I just find it to be very interesting that it's still something that impacts you to this day. It must have been, like, very terrible. It was. Well, I mean, it was... I felt like it was 38 years. So, I mean, that's... A habit is 21 days. This is 21 days times infinity, you know? And when you've got in your brain that something is different, like, I felt something was different... And then people exacerbated it by saying, you're gay. And I was like, well, they're not saying that in a nice way. So it must be that I'm bad for some, you know, this this thing that makes me bad feel different. Being gay. Right. And so I, years of years of spinning in that hamster wheel of trying to figure out what I can do to make it. So, yeah, it's, it's burned in there. But, you know, uh, living my life with you. And talking about it uh, in therapy and addressing it is is helps relieve the stress. I don't think it's ever going to go away. I think, you know, everyone has things in their childhood that are never going to go away because they were so impactful. They may fade a little bit. But even like the other day, uh, this past weekend, I said, Babe Balls, I reverted to this spot that uh, you said, you know, why'd you do that? And I was like, I authentically reverted to a spot where I didn't know what to do. And you're like, you knew what to do. And I said, I did. But my inner, my inner um, P 
P.S. My inner pre Sean was <laughs> forced its way to the top, and I was like, I don't know what to say to this person. I don't know how to react to this person. I'm just gonna say yes and be nice in hopes that if I'm nice, they're going to leave or they're going to just like get out of your space. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So so it still happens to me. Moving on to my next subject. Yes. Okay. Another thing that you talked about, you are an expert at. Yes. In 49 years is travel. Yes. First of all, before we get into travel, travel, tell me why you love airplanes so much. So, if I'm going to be really honest, and I hope this doesn't go anywhere, just between us and our friends. Our thousands of people that are to this. I uh, realized after several hours of thinking inside of my head that when I travel, I feel important. I feel mm. better than. I feel... Almost like I'm doing something, I'm going somewhere that other people are not going because of a purpose, and it's because of the hard work or dedication or whatever it is that I've done that I deserve this, and so therefore, I'm when I travel, I feel special. And so, uh, and I think that has a lot to do with when I was a kid because of the fact that, strong, you know, the gay thing is always going to be there, so I apologize for being a broken record, but... Because I, I felt less than in that area, but I was really good in soccer. I would go places and travel and make state and regional and national teams because I was really good. And so I then said, okay, well, this is, I'm actually not better than you, but I'm feeling better than you because I get to travel for this. Whereas you have to stay home and you have to, you know, stay in Everett and not do anything, right? So, uh, sadly, I know that's, the I'm basis... I'm not laughing because it's just funny. The it's basis funny. of me loving to travel is because back then it was because I was special because I was really good at something. Now, it's I think it still plays in that... You know, we've worked really hard. Usually when we're traveling, we're traveling for work or pre-pandemic. We travel for work or for pleasure. And we get to go and do things that we like to do. And so we're going for a purpose, like, because we're getting to do things that we like. So that's why I love travel. And I'm obsessed, obsessed, oddly, with, because of it, planes and routes and, like, a plane will fly over the house, and I'll, like, get on my app and see, you know, what flight is it, and where are they going, and what airline, and, and you know, uh, Jack, uh, Music Jack, posted something last night on social. He was at the Sydney airport, and he said, these are the only international flights that are leaving uh, Sydney, yeah. and there were only 13 flights. And you know what I did? I took a picture of it, and I looked at the screen to see what cities they were, and I'm like, okay, I wonder what route that is. I don't know why. I just think it's fun. So, you... At least for the, for years here at Team Shanti, I used to call you, I don't know what the word I used to call you, but I used to refer to you as controlling when it came to travel. You didn't want <laughs> anyone to book their travel. Why? Uh, I felt it was because I was an expert of being so many years of flying, so many years even before that of my dad flying. You know, and mom running his travel stuff, like because of the experience I had just watching and learning from my dad and mom, I had this base of knowledge that I don't think anyone had ever had. Anyone, I don't know, not many people have. And so I had, I felt like I had more information that would help me get a really cheap deal. And I love, I love saving money. You know me, I love, if I can save $20 or $5 on an airplane ticket, I will I will cancel one and book another because I'm saving that money. So you're the person that annoys the customer service reps at airlines. No, I'm always very nice. No, I didn't say you were nice. Kill okay. them with kindness. Give us some tips on how to travel cheaply. Uh, well, one of the best websites to go to is skiplagged.com, skiplagged, L-A-G-G-E-D.com, because they were a company that actually um, figured out the airplane booking system of United Airlines, and they figured out that if they do this and do that, uh, they could get a cheaper fare than what was actually being offered on United, and United sued them and lost... And so they uh, figured out their, their, their thing. And it was basically a just, it's about, um, they take uh, super cheap flights and 
uh, adjust them to how you can get there. And so a great website to go to if you're looking for cheap airfare is skiplagged.com. What are the pros and cons of becoming an airline member, meaning uh, having a membership, like getting points? It pros is, and cons. Well, it is, to me, it is... Uh, priceless to be able to fly one airline or stay with one hotel brand because I mean we get preferential treatment because I you know we have a 1-800 number to the platinum desk that will pretty much solve any issue that we have if you're stuck in let's say Sioux City Iowa and you can't get on a flight I call the the desk and you know how can we figure this out so and and um with Marriott, we stay with them so much. We have contacts there. Also, you know, when you um, had to get out in New York City pre-pandemic, we had booked a whole week of, of stuff that we were staying there. And because we stay at, at one of the hotels there in New York City so much, I called them up and I said, you know, we can we get a refund? Because, and they said, absolutely, Mr. Blocker, you know, we'll do anything to keep your business. So it's beneficial to to try and get status on these things because... Status helps. So what if, you know, how do you know? And the reason why I'm asking these questions is I'm like, okay, these are this is information. Like, I know this. But how do you actually find, how do you actually benefit from, like, getting points? Like, because I can, I can have, you know, 20,000 points in an airline, but not every flight I can use these 20,000 points. Right. right. So how do you go about that? So it's, again, understanding the system or the airline that you're working with. So help me understand it. I'm I'm getting to that. (laughs) So picture Sicily 1920. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, So, you know, let's use um, uh, Delta for an example, right? We have, we use American Express. And because of the American Express card we get, we get points. And I can transfer those points to Delta, uh, even exchange one-on-one. And we then can fly free on Delta. But you have to understand that every airline has their own mileage system. And uh, sometimes it's cheaper to uh, use less miles on Delta to go someplace. And sometimes it's cheaper on, on American. I find that American, you have to use more points to get somewhere for free. That to me is putting in the work. And because you travel so much, it's easy for me to put in the work. But as someone who doesn't travel as much, it's difficult for you to play around on the website to figure out unless you're actually buying a ticket and then accruing miles. And then, so uh, it's kind of a thing where you go to the website and you read their page about, you know, miles and how you can accrue them. And um, when you buy this level of ticket, you get more points because it's a higher expensive, you know, ticket. When you go to the websites and American or United or Delta and they have the super cheap fare, you're probably not getting any points. Because this is the super, super ultra low fare. You're probably paying to have to use the bathroom. But if that's what you're not really. But if that's what you, the ticket that you want to pay for and you you have to pay for your bags and you have to pay for your check bag. Or you can't bring on a bag or whatever. Then that's okay. I mean, you just have to realize that what you pay for is what you're going to get. And therefore, you don't. You Sometimes you get points and sometimes you don't. So if you're not in a mileage program, use skip lag. And if you are in a mileage program, be fully loyal to that Try to that be, credit card so that you can benefit from that. Yes. Because the, the more you spend, the more they're like, oh, well, who are you? And why do I need to pay attention to you? Because, um, you know, you're spending money with my company. Yeah. I remember when I used to travel to Europe a lot, I would only fly Swiss and Lufthansa. And I had no idea about miles and stuff like that. But I did sign up for the mileage program because I was traveling a lot and I said, well, I'm just going to sign up for this because Mm -hmm. at some point I'll get a free flight or whatever. I just, I didn't care. And I showed up at the airport. I bought an economy ticket to fly to Germany and I got to the gate and they were like, oh, Mr. Blocker, you've been upgraded Upgraded. to business class. For free. And then I could go to the lounge for the first time. For free. That was the first time that it ever happened and I said, there's no turning back so Mm -hmm. i was star alliance gold Mm -hmm. for a long time in american airlines as well then i started understanding that so but also think this too you know we have been on on flights on american where the flight attendant recognized you from an earlier flight right if you are spending a lot of time in a public situation 
if you start to see familiar faces, you build, oh, I've seen you before. Like, you were on my flight maybe last week or whatever. And they're like, so then that's a rapport. And they're like, well, what do you want today? Honey? They're always like, sweetheart, what do you want? So you get free drinks, you get food, you get whatever. And it's like, you know. This courtesy. Yeah. I mean, they're always courteous, but I think right. they appreciate the loyalty. Yeah. So. Okay. Last section of my interview with you. Obviously, we're not experts on being parents yet because we've only been yes. parents for three years, and there are people who've been parents for eighteen and thirty and forty nine. Who probably look years. at us like I look at other people when it, right? Yeah, yeah. But there are new parents out there who do look to us because we are within reach, mm-hmm. you know. And I do realize that there are a lot of parents who've been parents for forty, fifty years, and they don't remember. Yeah. The, the zero to three-year-old, because it was so long ago. Mm-hmm. What can you tell parents, uh, what can you tell new parents or parent, people who are about to become parents? What can you, what kind of, not advice, I don't want to say advice, but what, what kind of... Looking back, what would I have done differently? No, no, no. I don't think it's what you've done differently because every kid is different. I'm saying just what are some things you can tell that parent to help ease the next three years of their Perfect. life if they're a new parent? I have two things off the top of my head. One, train yourself to ask for help. Meaning, I had to train myself to say, can you help me? Because of growing up as a kid, I remember my mom taking care of us. And it was just my mom and my dad, you know, he was working and stuff. But, you know, my mom handled two kids. So I'm thinking to myself, well, I should definitely be able to handle two kids and a husband and a job because that's what, I mean, my mom. Did. You handle me? <laughs> and my that motherfucking I handle difficult. my husband. No, but I, you know, my mom didn't have a job. Her job was raising us, right? So. But that is a job. Right. But I'm, I'm saying... You she know, didn't have a job outside of Right, her. right. So I'm saying to myself, well, if she did it, I can definitely do it, right? And I realized three months in, no sleep in, fighting, uh, I was like, I, 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 while I thought I was doing the job, I was losing. Or we were losing. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It wasn't until you said, we're going on a date, we're hiring help, we are you know, getting help because we need time for ourselves. That was life changing. So for me, it's about being able to, you have to be able to ask for help and it's okay to ask for help. And while you might feel guilty about it, or you may not feel guilty about it, you have to ask for help because if you don't take care of yourself and then take care of your relationship, you won't, uh, it will suffer. But so my question to you is you, you you say that a lot. You know, if I hadn't asked for a date night. But what were you going to do? Just like raise kids and not go out on a date ever again? Yes. Not ever again, but you know, Babels, I have a I have a I don't know if you know this about me. I have a tendency of sticking in something for a while and not really, you know, because to me I like 32,000 feet and 32,000 feet may seem like it's really good, but it's not like, because I, I'm like, I can deal with this. I do. I dealt with something for 38 years. I can deal with this. That's my thinking. Yeah. I just think that I'm not judging you. I just, I'm more interested in the, the mentality of I'm miserable, but I'm going to stay here. Yeah. It's, I think it's, it is, um, three things. One, the work it will take to get me out of this is too much. So therefore I'll stay. Second, the image and what I've created of what is going to happen when I get out of it is so bad that I'm just going to stay. And then the other thing is, is, well, they didn't ask for help. So why should I? So those are three things that are playing impacting my brain that I don't even realize uh, that if I just take a 30 minute break, I'm going to feel that much more energized or an hour break or 20 minutes or five minutes. So it's also like your ego, like you're kind of yep. like, like we all have. And I'm not going to ask for help because I can do this. Yeah. I was just listening to a podcast that said ego is the, is the, is the, dis- is the disaster of creativity or something like that. Because if, oh, it was, um, I was listening to Smartless with uh, Reese Witherspoon. It's when uh, Jason Bateman, Will and Arnett, and um, 
Jack from Will and Grace. Mm-hmm. They um, all have a podcast and they bring in a surprise guest and they brought in Reese Witherspoon that <laughs> one person knows and the other two people don't know. And she was talking about how she's like, people who have an ego, they have to leave their ego at the door because ego impacts and restricts so many things. So Yeah, but I think we all have an ego and I don't think you really leave it at the door. I think you just... Do, like it becomes dormant yes it yeah, like yeah. hides it's I'm been not because we all i mean we it's impossible not to have an ego correct because like, the yeah. more you progress in your career mm-hmm. or you become successful in your sport or whatever it is yeah you know people who play tennis they have an ego when they walk out in the mm-hmm. court and i'm like bitch you can't even hit the ball right right but they have this <laughs> ego, and i'm like you need to tame that mm-hmm. but that makes a lot of sense okay what was the second thing you said there were two things oh uh, I would say reading to your child. Like it, it is such, there's so many different wonderful levels that happen when you read to your child every single night. Not only do you build a pattern of, of and kids and the newborn stage, they need a pattern. They need something that they know is going to be there. That not only do you get to have one-on-one time with your kid or one-on-two or, you know, if you're doing it as a family, you're having family time with the kid. You're building the bond. You're building the, you know, if they're laying on your chest, they're feeling your heartbeat, they're feeling your smells and all that. But you're also teaching them words and their brain is a sponge that is sucking everything up that you don't even realize it until one day they're like, ball. And you're like, holy shit, did you just say ball? Like, that's your first word. Like, how, why is this happening? Mm. That reading is so important to, and I never really, you know, growing up in a a family of educators, they're always saying, you should read to your kids, read to your kids. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's turning into a cliche. But to see the impact it had on our kids, I am 100% like, yeah. And there's so, some books are so colorful and so like you can really engage and get into the the magicalness of I, I uh, think books. that what's really interesting is even now they wake up in the morning sometimes at six o'clock and they don't come into our room till seven and they have a full on one hour conversation and sometimes I'll sit there and like for like three minutes and I'll count the amount of words. I'm like they've used like 150 words in these mm-hmm. like few minutes that I didn't even know they knew that word and they only know or the meaning or the inflection or the past present tense, you know, or in future tense of words. And last night, Sander said, he said, Mackenzie brought us a new um, pajama outfit. Bought us a new. He said brought. Oh, okay. And I said, and I, and I went to teach him. I said, oh, okay. I was like, did she get it from the store? He said, yes. And I said, oh, she bought it for you. And I was like, when she gets it from the store, she bought it for you. If she brings it from her home, she brought it to you. Yeah. And he was, he said it over and over again. He was like, she bought mm-hmm. it. She he, bought it. Yeah. And then this morning he was, he used both of them in different ways. He was like, he said, brother brought me this. And he said, uh, Des bought me and I was That's just I thought it was like wow. the coolest thing I was like oh my gosh it, I know it's silly for no, people out there but, but yeah it may be silly but yeah. for to, to see it happen and to see their brains working you're like whoa and I don't know if you've seen this you know when we put the boys to bed we tell them that they can all have a toy they bring a toy up but they have to put them to sleep um, so they usually pull open one of the drawers and they put the toy in and I don't know have you seen Silas read a story to the toy when he's putting it to sleep no not oh yet. my god it is the craziest thing so he will he will I'm like okay Silas it's time to put your toy to sleep and so he opens the door he puts the, the thing in he tucks them in gives him a kiss and he says um, once upon a time there was a little truck blah 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 the end <laughs> and then shuts the door like he tells them a story it is the most amazing thing but it's also you know it also shows that as you know what you do as parents is ref- it reflects on the kids and they learn so whether it's telling a story or hate or you know just so many things like that can be absorbed by them that it's it's incredible I, I just came across the photo of the first day we ever read them a book, The Garuffalo, when yeah. they got home. And it was The Garuffalo, and I was just like, oh my gosh. And they still know that book. Yeah. Um, okay, last little section, because I know you got things to do. I got to run a business, baby. Um, 
So 2020 has been a crazy year for a lot of people. Uh, but I just want to do a little fun speed round. Question number one. Mm-hmm. What was your favorite moment in 2020? Hugging you. When? When? All, every day, every time I wake up in the morning, anytime I fall asleep, like, just anytime you come in and say that I love you, like, that is the most special, like, you, you melt my heart every time you say I love you. That's just because you think I'm hot. It has nothing to do with <laughs> I'm being just hot. Kidding. It is I'm nothing, being silly. I'm being it is silly. purely because uh, anytime you, like, come in for a hug, we snuggle in bed, it's like, that is the best moment. What is what was your favorite place you've been to in 2020? Well, it's not many. The first thing that comes to my mind is where we go in Puerto Vallarta, because it is, and you know, we've talked about this. It's just this place where they have a rooftop pool, and there is no care in the world. I'm usually not on. I mean, I'll be doing some social stuff, you know, just watching. But it's a drink in hand, an infinity pool, and this amazing view. And it's, you know, some cool jazz music in the background or some sort of music. And I just lay and relax. And I can lay and relax for, you know, five hours or so. And then we go downstairs and take a nap. And then, you know, we go have dinner or something. And then... What was your favorite purchase of 2020? Well, uh, I know what was purchased for me, which is at the top of my list right now. What is it? It's what I just got for my birthday. The purple... Okay, I'm not a vest person and I'm not an, a label person. And I'll <laughs> just say this. When I opened up this gift, uh, it's a purple vest. It's a, it's a Dior vest that I nearly shit my pants. And I'm not even that type of person. But I was like, this is the most, one of the most epic gifts ever. Yeah, but you didn't buy that. What was your fit? That was no, the, that's what I'm I saying. purchased that's that. That's what I asked. Was it okay? <laughs> because, well, we, we purchased it, actually. No, nah, I, I purchased that. I purchased <laughs> that. I did. That was from my money, which you probably saw when you were I skimming did. through my personal I bank didn't. account. I was told not to. Um, hmm. but just the purple and the, and the silver and the weight of the zipper. But where did you purchase? Epic. Cause that was mine. That was, I epic. purchased that. Okay. I'll let you have it. All right. What was the biggest lesson you've learned in 2020? Um, I, it always comes to patience. You know, this is, um, when, when the States and started to lock down, I remember March 13th was when, uh, Friday the 13th. And I was thinking to myself, okay, you know, I can lock down for a month. That's fine, you know, because as I always joke about, they're going to pull out the secret um, the, uh, vaccine, Ocean. the secret vaccine from like the depths of Norway up in this this underground. That they've had stores in 1930. They have, and they have all these seats. I've seen documentaries on this place where there's in Norway where they've, they have this entire like underground seed village because if in just in case the world does go into apocalyptic whatever, they can then use those seeds to replant and be you know build the earth again right so i'm sure they got a vaccine in there somewhere right so i'm like i can do a month and then we're like oh it looks like we're gonna do another month and then it looks like i knew we're gonna do another month and i'm like oh we gotta have patience and i think the other thing was being able to pivot like instantly for us i think i remember okay we can't do events anymore how are we going to survive like and it went it went this quick i was like i remember thinking we're, I just can't, we just canceled this, this, and this, and we're not doing this, and we're not doing this. Uh, how are we going to survive as a company and as a family? Oh my God, you are so dramatic. I'm, but that's, <laughs> you know, my job is to, to manage the money and to make sure that people get paid, right? Yeah, so I know. I'm for just, me... But I, I'm just saying your choice of words, like, how are we going to survive? But that's how I think. <laughs> and so it, we got it, we stepped into motion, right? And I credit our team because... Like, they were all in, you know? We had the team meeting on Monday morning, and we said, hey, guys, like, we need to figure this shit out, and if we don't, we're all going to not not do so well. And they did, and they were amazing. They have been amazing. So, being able to pivot. Patience and pivot. Thank you for joining. We hope you had an amazing 2021 so far, and I've really challenged you to answer some of those questions for yourself so that you can take the positives and move into the future. We'll see you next time here on Trust and Believe.